All right, folks, on this week's video, we're gonna take a break from the bows and the hunting and all the other stuff that I usually do to take a look at some of the other projects that we do and answer a question that people are genuinely curious about, and that's how we can live our lives the way that we do, split in time between Idaho and uh, Florida and kind of traveling around and having all the freedom that we have. So any of you that have followed my channel for very long know that we have a place in North Idaho that we spend about six months at. And then we also have a place down here in Northwest Florida where we come and spend the late winter, early spring months. Uh, we're still down here in Florida right now. We're gonna be headed back up to Idaho here uh, in a month or so, but we, are self-employed. Both my wife and I uh, work for ourselves and we can set our own schedule. Now that in combination with uh, homeschooling the kids, which we've been doing for the last couple of years, um, really allows us to be able to move around at will. Now this might sound like we are wealthy or well off and we don't have to work like everyone else, but I assure you that is not the case. Uh, just take some off the, to the stiff part. So the, these lines that I scribed back on there. Yep. So again, just take your rasp and go and lay those lines back. Now we have had great opportunities, of course, but the, one of the things that allows us to do this is that we have made it a priority to be able to do this. I think it's very common, at least in this country, for folks to want things or to desire things that they can't outright pay for. And of course, to get around that, you go get a loan and then you go get the things that you want. But what that often turns into is you have the thing, but the thing also has you. Meaning that you have to, when you, when you get yourself in debt like that, you're stuck having to work to pay for that thing. And so one of the things that we have really focused on is trying to remain as debt free as possible. Now, for me personally, and for my family, I, we have been very, very blessed because I can, uh, I've been blessed with creativity, ingenuity, and I can uh, use my hands a lot. I can build, fix, fabricate pretty much anything that we need or want. Uh, one great example of that is our vehicles. We own both of our vehicles. We have no car payments. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is because I built my truck. We had a, uh, a single cab Dodge Cummins and with a family of four, that just was not cutting it. And so I wanted a crew cab, something that I could haul everybody around in. And so if you've priced a crew cab uh, four wheel drive pickup lately, they are insanely expensive. You're talking 40, 50, 60 thousand dollars. And that is unacceptable for me. I'm not, I'm not gonna go pay that for a truck. And so uh, I decided to go ahead and just build one. So I took the single cab that I had, I went and found a crew cab, older 1980 power wagon, brought that home and stripped both trucks down to the frame took both of them and made one truck. So I've got a crew cab uh, power wagon with a 12, 12 valve Cummins. And on top of that, I converted that to run on waste vegetable oil, which I get for free. And so not only did I save the money on a, a new truck, but I also don't have to pay for fuel for the thing. Now rebuilding that truck was a year long process. And so during that time, I drove an Isuzu that I bought for 500 bucks. And the reason I got that Isuzu so cheap is because the transmission was slipping when I got it, but luckily it turned out that it was just a seal that was dro dropping the transmission fluid. So I fixed the seal for about 20 bucks and that vehicle served me well uh, for the year when I was rebuilding my truck. After I got done with it, I sold the Isuzu for, I can't remember if it was 12 or 15, but anyway, I made money on it, uh, which helped to pay for th some of the uh, parts on my truck. So our place up in Idaho is very small. The house is very small by today's standard. Uh, we have a family of four and our house is less than 800 square feet. And so it's a, it's a pretty small little space. But last year we started a pretty major remodel. A remodel that probably if we had bought all the materials may have cost $20,000 or more. 
but uh, of course I'm averse to that type of expenditure for things that I can do or scavenge or, or um, repurpose myself. And so we found one of our neighbors that had an old garage. It was actually an old barn that was built in the 1940s and it was all built with old uh, virgin cut um, western red cedar and dug fir and they wanted it gone. And so we went down there and demoed the barn in exchange for the wood. We got a ton of great old barn wood off of that and a lot of that stuff we used uh, inside the house for the walls. Now it was a lot of work uh, for both Liz and I but I think it was a great swap because you know we could have bought that stuff it would have been very expensive but I'm partial to that older stuff like that. I like things that have a history or that have a story attached to them. So we got a lot of wood off that barn, things that are going to be great for the flooring in the house, the walls and all of that stuff. But we have uh, other things that we want to build. We want to build an extension onto the back of it. Uh, we built a covered porch onto the front. And for that, I went and talked to another neighbor. And when I say neighbor, this is like Idaho standard neighbor. They're miles away. Uh, is, I think our closest neighbor is uh, about two miles down the road. But anyway, I went and talked to another neighbor and borrowed his sawmill and was able to cut a couple of trees off our property and mill up enough lumber so that we'll be able to, to do these, uh, these extensions. Um, and so all of this stuff uh, really didn't cost us a whole lot, maybe a few thousand dollars um, in materials. And then I went ahead and bought a, a sprayer because I'm going to redo the outside and cedar shakes. And I need something to be able to, to spray that stuff uh, every few years and, and keep it protected from the elements. Now there's still a lot more work to do on our place up there in Idaho. And we, we're going to get started on it when we go back up there this year. Uh, and try to finish it uh, this year. At least uh, we'll finish the kitchen, we'll finish the, uh, the front porch and all that stuff. We want to screen in the front porch, but there are other things that we want to do up there that are going to be take us years into the future. Now down in Florida, we live in a barn, literally. There is a living space above the horse stalls uh, there at my dad's place, and we've been staying in there. But just recently, um, I got the opportunity to do something that I've always wanted to do, and that's build a, or get started on a pretty good size, really nice log cabin. Uh, my brother decided that he wanted to clear some land for a pasture, and there were quite a few pretty good size uh, longleaf pine in there that needed to come down. So instead of just knocking them down and having someone haul them off, I uh, went ahead and decided that this was my opportunity uh, to go ahead and get started on a cabin. So we went ahead and cut them up, loaded them on a trailer, and brought them back over to the house. And for the past two weeks or so, I've been peeling these logs, and I've been really fortunate enough to have some help doing that. Uh, but we've just about got all the logs peeled that I have. Now, I, I still don't have quite enough to do the cabin, and so uh, I am going to have to cut about 20 more, I'd say 12 to 15 inch uh, longleaf pine, and, and we'll be able to do that on the place here. And some of them that I'm going to use are uh, trees that have been killed by flooding from beavers. I've actually cut a few already. But the beavers dammed up the creek here and they flooded a couple of acres of timber and a lot of the longleaf that are in there, there's probably some slash pine in there too. You just can't handle that level of inundation and so a lot of them are dead and dying and I'm going to go ahead and salvage those and use a lot of that in the cabin as well. So I don't tend to plan very well. That's Liz's department. I just have to kind of figure things out as I go. But nevertheless, I have a rough idea of uh, the dimensions and the type of cabin that I want to build. So I, I think with the materials that I have, I can build one with the interior dimensions of about 24 by 30 uh, with a loft in it. Um, <clears throat> now most people would have their design and their blueprints uh, ready and figured out before they start cutting logs, but that's just not the way things worked out in this case. I had the logs just kind of dumped in my lap and so I decided to take advantage of that so that I wouldn't let that opportunity uh, pass us by. 
So if you spend very much time around me, you will quickly come to realize that I have a bad case of ADD. It is very hard for me to stay on task uh, doing something. And so I, I start on a project like this and I start peeling logs and then I think, well, I'm building the cabin and so I'm gonna need a, quite a bit of dimensional lumber for the floors, the floor joists, uh, the floor decking, the roof uh, decking and things like that. And so uh, I started looking into sawmills. Now the sawmills, if you start looking into new sawmills, one that is going to do what I want to do is you're not going to find one for less than $10,000 and it's probably going to be more like $15,000. Um, being the way that I am, I am not about to pay $15,000 for something that I can build myself. And so I took a break from the logs to start thinking about building a sawmill um, because I'm also going to have to build a shed to store the logs under until we can start construction. And I did not want to buy dimensional lumber and spend $1,000 on lumber uh, when I could spend $500, build a sawmill, and then cut all the lumber that I need for the shed to cover the logs, plus all the lumber that I need for the cabin anyway. And so I remembered that my brother had a, an old uh, Lister two-cylinder generator. It's probably been 15 years stuck in the woods back there. So I went over, uh, grabbed that uh, old generator out of the woods. So I was gonna use the motor out of that generator to as the power plant for my sawmill that I'm planning on building. Unfortunately, the mice chewed a hole in an intake hose which allowed access into the intake manifold. Uh, they stuffed a bunch of acorns in there and then also allowed uh, dirt daubers to get in there and put um, a bunch of mud and stuff in the intake uh, manifold sitting up against one of the push rods. And so I'm, I'm gonna try, I'm, I've, I've taken the heads off of this engine. Uh, I'm gonna try to clean everything out, reassemble everything, and hopefully I can get that little two cylinder diesel to fire up because that would be a stellar power plant for a pretty good sized sawmill. I, it remains to be seen whether or not I'm gonna be able to get that thing going or not. I'm really crossing my fingers because if not, that's gonna be a major setback uh, for the sawmill. I was really hoping to have that um, motor because that's, that's one of the, the big things that I need that it's, if I have to buy something, that's gonna be a pretty major expense. Um, so I'm hoping to be able to repurpose this generator engine. But um, again, we're gonna to have to wait and see on that. So when I first started researching how to build one of these things, of course I went to YouTube because that's my go-to place to learn how to build something. Uh, and I started looking and there are a lot of different sawmill builds on YouTube, but probably the most helpful one that I have found so far was uh, on Matt Cremona. I hope I said that right, but I probably screwed it up. Anyway, he is building an absolutely massive bandsaw mill, but he's doing it very very well, very well designed, um, nice adjustments, uh, just doing a really good job on it. And so I think I'm gonna take a lot of his ideas and just build kind of a scaled down version of what he's building with a couple of modifications. Now being on the farm, there's always scrap steel around just from projects that have been completed in the past, just leftover stuff. And so I'm going to try to use as much of that stuff as possible so that I don't have to buy a bunch of steel. And I think, I think I can get a fairly sizable sawmill, something that would be comparable to something uh, commercially available for maybe, you know, 15 to 18,000. I think I can build one for less than 500 bucks. Um, I'm going to try to get that done before we go back to Idaho, but that is really gonna be contingent on being able to get this engine started. If I can't get the engine started, uh, I'm gonna have to go back to the drawing board. So I guess to wrap this video up, the takeaway is that we, are, we have a tremendous amount of freedom. We are very, very fortunate in how we get to live our lives. Now, a lot of that is due to opportunities. We have the place down here in Florida that we can come. This is my folks' place. And so we didn't have to, we didn't have to spend much of money to buy this. Uh, we 
Uh, the only debt that we have is our place up in Idaho. And as I said, it's a very small little farmhouse. It's barely big enough for us, but that helped to keep us out of tremendous debt. We do still owe some on the house up there, but it is very, very manageable because it is small. Uh, we have 20 acres uh, around our place up there. Um, but then in addition to those things, we've just made it a priority to stay out of debt. You know, everybody that follows my channel knows that I hunt, uh, we grow a big garden, and so we keep our grocery bill to a minimum. Uh, we just don't need a lot of money. Now you might look at all this stuff that I'm doing and say, man, that's a lot of work. How does he have time to actually make a living to do all this stuff? And it is a lot of work. It keeps me busy uh, pretty much every day. Um, when I'm not doing this stuff, I should say when I'm not making a living, I'm doing this stuff. Now, the, how I make a living is I, uh, I make videos on YouTube, I do bow building classes, I make, uh, make self bows, um, I have a website where I sell books, DVDs, things like that. So that is what pays the bills and allows us to move around and, and to do all this stuff. But uh, like I said, we really, the type of lifestyle that we live is, is we really don't need a lot but we have plenty. Now, if you guys are interested in any of this stuff that, uh, that I mentioned, the, the cabin build, uh, the sawmill, or any of that stuff, I'm gonna be documenting that stuff as I go along uh, anyway, so it wouldn't be very hard to just put out some videos on that type of stuff. Now, uh, one of the challenges for um, getting a bunch of views on YouTube is that YouTube seems to kind of pigeonhole you a little bit if you make videos outside of what your channel is known for. And mine is known for archery and hunting and things like that. Um, they tend to kind of not really promote it unless it starts to get a bunch of views. And so if you guys are interested in this stuff, you want to see more videos, you can help uh, by just sharing these videos. Share them to your, uh, your social media pages. Um, share them to anybody that, that you think might be interested and that's gonna help to get eyes on these videos and help me to make more of them. Also, please leave a comment and give it a thumbs up. That really helps a lot as well. And if you wanna keep up with all this stuff, go ahead and subscribe to the channel and uh, you'll be able to get it and click the bell icon. That's gonna give you an alert when, uh, when I upload a new video. All right, that's gonna do it. We'll see you next time.